Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have you ever made that plea? I've cried it thousands of times. So many things I've done and left undone. Lord, have mercy on me. And thank you for your mercy. In today's gospel, Jesus and his disciples are on their journey towards Jerusalem, passing through the town of Jericho. A blind beggar, Bartimaeus, was sitting by the roadside. There was nothing else for blind people to do in those days. There was no training, no welfare for people with disabilities, simply begging those who pass by. He hears from the crowd that Jesus is passing by. He raises his strong voice and shouts, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He knows the name of this Nazarene because his fame has reached to all the towns and villages. But when he says, son of David, that immediately puts Jesus in the royal succession and identifies him as the Messiah. Unlike the spiritually blind society that did not recognize Jesus as the Messiah, this physically blind man reacts as though he was waiting for Jesus to come by. The acceptance of this title <clears throat> on the part of Jesus is what the enemies of Jesus were waiting for so that they could arrest him. To claim the title of the son of David would be to lay claim to the royal kinship and to the role of the weighted Messiah. Bartimaeus knows it's now or never. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. The bystanders who heard Bartimaeus sternly warned him to be quiet. That's Bible talk for shut up. But that makes Bartimaeus even more determined. He shouts even louder. He must have had a great voice because Jesus stood still. And Jesus heard the words that matter. Have mercy on me. The words of faith echoing through the centuries. Kyrie eleison. Lord, have mercy. The crowd takes heart, says, get up. He's calling you. What comforting words. Take heart, the Lord has heard your cry. Take heart, your prayer has reached the ears of the Lord. Take heart, you are no longer alone. You are not a despised person begging by the roadside. Your request has been heard. And you are being summoned to the throne of grace. Aren't these words that we all long to hear? Every person who has suffered and who hasn't wants to be heard by someone who has mercy. Justice and righteousness have entered Jericho and stand there in the person of Jesus. Bartimaeus believed. He had no doubt that Jesus was the son of David, the Messiah, and he knew that only Jesus could heal him. God intervenes in the person of Jesus Christ. This is what we Christians believe. It's the basic truth of our faith. Our heart long for mercy. And the Son of God responds to this longing. When Jesus calls, Bartimaeus does not hesitate. He throws down his cloak and springs up like someone who is ready to run. Someone with a purpose attracted by the powerful presence toward whom the path is now open and the blind man goes before him. 
Jesus wants him to articulate his prayer. Bartimaeus had asked for mercy, but Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? Last week, we heard the same question from the two disciples who had come to Jesus wanting to be first in the kingdom. What is it you want me to do for you, he asked. Bartimaeus says, Teacher, let me see again. It's obvious from these words that Bartimaeus had not been blind from birth. Let me see again, he says. And he has no doubt that Jesus is the one to give him back his sight. Would we dare to cry out the words that that we need? To cry out the words it it was uh, for our intentions of our hearts. Jesus tells him, as he has said to many others, go, your faith has made you well. Can you imagine more wonderful words than these? Jesus tells him to go. But Bartimaeus stands with him. He cannot go away from this source of light. He is ready to follow Jesus from now on. We don't know what happens after this. We don't know if he went all the way to Jerusalem with Jesus to witness the triumphant entry and the agony of the passion. Mark simply tells us that he regained his sight and followed him on his way. What lingers in my thoughts is that Jesus also asked us, what do you want me to do for you? Think about that for a moment. What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for you? To find a better job? Or a nicer home? Or better neighbors? To have more money? For peace? For more care for our planet? For more passion and patience and compassion? to have more faith, for more justice, to be better advocates? What do you want Jesus to do for you? To give us clear sight to see the suffering in the world and to help relieve that suffering? and to be advocates for this justice, for perseverance, to know that our faith heals us also. What do you want Jesus to do for you? To be more grateful? To learn to keep our mouths shut when we ought to? To know that God is present. He's as close as our breath. To love God and to love our neighbors. To be kind. More kind, especially to the people that we live with. To respect the dignity of every person. is in today's colic, to increase in us the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. We probably all want these things and even more. At the vestry meeting Thursday night, Anna said something to the effect that St. Luke's is showing our love 
by how, by how we are loving her dad, Jim, to help him through this tough time. We continue to love and to help and to pray for one another. It's what we do best. It's what we're called to do. If we have more love, we will live better lives. What do you want Jesus to do for us? Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Help us to love more. Help us to love better. Let us pray. Dear Lord, help us to turn to you and receive the sight that makes us see the Son of God in all his compassion and mercy. Let us follow on the way, never falling by the wayside, because as this story assures us, in the midst of the great crowd, each one of us, however small, or despised, or poor, we all matter to Jesus. And Lord, help us to love better. Amen.